who Elizabeth Smith Friedman is? No. Do you know who Elizabeth Smith Friedman is? No. Do you know who Elizabeth Smith Friedman is? No. No. No, I do not. No. I don't. No. 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 No, I do not. I do not. No. I do not. the very greatest graduate, the best of all the alumni this college ever has produced, may be Elizabeth Smith Friedman. During Prohibition, Elizabeth was the chief cryptographer and only woman who worked for the Coast Guard. She broke enemy codes, she hunted Nazi spies, and in between she broke up smuggling rings. It's an amazing story that we're only just now here at the college beginning to understand and appreciate as fully as we might. She was a woman who sparkled with intelligence. Everybody who met her notices this woman's really smart. My grandmother saved the free world, uh, which I don't think is too big of a stretch. Elizabeth Friedman was a young lady raised in the Midwest of the United States. Um, she was unusual in that she had a desire to go to college in the 19 aughts, which uh, was not the normal thing for a young woman to do. Elizabeth was born in 1892 to a large Quaker family in Huntington, Indiana. She developed a love of learning at a young age and decided she wanted to attend college. Elizabeth left home in 1911 to attend Worcester College in Ohio, even though her father disapproved of her pursuit of education and helped her pay for it reluctantly, only if she agreed to pay it back at 6% interest. In 1913, in order to be closer to home, where her mother had fallen ill, she transferred to a little school in rural Michigan called Hillsdale College. Her time at Hillsdale impacted her in ways that would last her her entire life. And it was here on this campus that she fell in love with the liberal arts. She was in some ways the ultimate liberal arts student. And the thing she really fell in love with was William Shakespeare, the plays of William Shakespeare. She enjoyed college. She made good friends at college. Um, we have her diaries here that she wrote while she was in school. And they show that she was really rather perceptive about herself and the world around her. She was extremely good at everything she ever did. Uh, she was an English major here. But that, you know, first of all, we, we don't make anybody into anything here. We help them grow. And she grew into a woman who could do anything with her mind. Every time you look at a work of literature, whether it's a, a poem by Robert Frost or a novel by Jane Austen or a play by William Shakespeare, you're trying to break the code. You're trying to understand what is this thing about? What are the symbols and the metaphors and the hidden meanings? And sometimes the meanings are obvious, sometimes they're not. You really have to think through it hard. You have to decipher what these texts are about. And so Elizabeth Smith learned how to do this on the campus of Hillsdale by studying these works of literature, Shakespeare especially, and learn how to tease out the meanings from texts and find hidden ideas, and that's what she ultimately applied to her career in code breaking for the federal government. If you study all the greatest things, uh, first of all, you're really only studying one thing. You're studying different approaches to it. Then your mind will become nimble, and you will have a, be able to survey the world and see its parts, and see the various ways that we best address those parts. And so, major in English at Hillsdale College, you can do anything. So too, history. So too, chemistry. And uh, so, so, so too, anything. If it's a fundamental subject, then it ends up applying to 
life. And that better helps you understand what life is like. She was involved in a sorority while she was at Hillsdale. Um, she was majoring in English literature. She loved poetry. She loved Shakespeare. She loved to write. I think she knew early on in her college career that her options once she finished school were somewhat limited to her and she knew that she did not want to be a teacher. After college she did have a few months when she was looking for a job that she became a high school principal and that was enough to convince her she didn't want to be a teacher. She really developed a fondness for Shakespeare. She studied Shakespeare. She loved Shakespeare and she came out of this place with a great appreciation for Shakespeare and all kinds of literature but especially Shakespeare. When I was in college, when I graduated from college, I uh, was totally unaware that there was such a thing as uh, um, codes and ciphers, uh, not even to call it uh, by its scientific name, uh, cryptography and cryptanalysis. My husband coined the word cryptanalysis to describe a new process uh, later. He did that, and then he later joined the two, uh, forming the word uh, cryptology. But all that was in the future for me. There was this eccentric millionaire in Illinois who had a big Shakespeare research project, and he, he met her by chance almost, and needed some Shakespeare experts to come in and 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 get involved in a crazy project he had. He thought there were secrets hidden within the plays and poems of Shakespeare, and he wanted to hire Shakespeare experts to, to dig through it and find out the hidden meanings, and it was all a bunch of nonsense. She and the man who became her husband went to work for a man who thought that uh, Francis Bacon wrote Shakespeare's plays. Colonel Fabian, as he was known, he was an honorific Colonel Fabian, had probably more money than sense in that he was very wealthy and he pulled in some of the best and the brightest young people working on varied subjects from um, sound dampening in recordings to this idea that there are codes in Shakespeare to genetics with insects and genetics with, with, um, with crops. So he was pulling in all of these young people who had expertises and having them work, paying for them to work on these projects. Um, for Elizabeth, it was exciting and a little bit intimidating. Her first meeting with Colonel Fabian was really rather dramatic. And Fabian's a big, big, huge guy, six foot four, I believe, you know, close to 300 pounds, boisterous, loud, you know, giving my grandmother what for and taking her to some place she's never been. Uh, and she had the courage to, to go through with that and, and as I understand from the books I've read, you know, kind of kind of stood up to him, you know, and you tell me what you know, well you tell me what you know. She was visiting Chicago looking for a job, stopped in the, the library there to see the folio of Shakespeare, talked with the librarian and the librarian hooked her up with Colonel Fabian who basically kidnapped her onto a train and took her to Riverbank for dinner in the night so she could see what was going on there and he explained to her what he wanted to bring her into work on. That was actually the night she met William at dinner. Uh, but she was working for these two sisters who thoroughly were convinced that there were codes in Shakespeare and that Francis Bacon had written them. But Elizabeth Smith loved Shakespeare. She, she jumped at the opportunity to do this. She took it very seriously. She tried to, to break the Shakespeare code. Elizabeth was frustrated with herself because she wasn't seeing these differences in font that apparently other people were seeing. Ultimately, she decided there was no such thing. This was a, a fool's errand. But it was her love of Shakespeare and literature that she developed at Hillsdale College that made this possible. Elizabeth learned a lot about codes. She also learned there were no codes in Shakespeare. And she met her future husband, William Friedman, working on that project. William was brought in because the original Shakespeare folios were very small to take photographs of them and blow them up since he used photography in his genetic studies. And that's how William and Elizabeth got to know each other better. My grandparents wound up working together uh, and falling in love. Um, but she was the one that was there to begin deciphering the Shakespeare 
uh, folios and just in trying to figure out if Sir Francis Bacon was the actual author of Shakespeare. She brought my grandfather in because he was taking photographs and could enlarge the fonts. They thought that maybe there was something different with the different typefaces. And they wind up falling in love. She brings him into code breaking. Elizabeth was the person who encouraged William to pursue code breaking and leave genetics behind. Elizabeth started teaching him everything that she had learned on her own outside of work, reading and studying about codes, making codes, breaking codes. Um, so she started sharing that interest with William um, and William started studying on his own as well. So they, they together were discovering this world of enciphered communications and, and discovered that they were pretty good at it. They started um, playing around with different codes. Um, it, it came to William, I mean, to, to Colonel Fabian's attention uh, that they were very adept at making and breaking codes. And so he thought, aha, here I have something that I can offer the government that will make me look really good. And so he, he um, offered their services to the federal government to make and break coded uh, communications. And for six months prior to the United States entry into the war, William Elizabeth and one other man broke every single piece of communications that the federal government had, Justice Department, Commerce Department, War Department, everything. It was extremely difficult work. It kept them working long, long hours, but they showed that they were very adept with it. Then as the United States started to get ready to enter the war, Fabian offered them yet again um, as a, a teaching opportunity for the U.S. Army to come in and to have the U.S. Army officers learn about making and breaking codes that they could take over into France and use in the field. Now, William and Elizabeth were not consulted about teaching this class in, in nearby Geneva. Um, so what they did was they developed the curriculum at night, they taught it the next morning. They developed the curriculum at night, they taught it the next morning. Some of the curriculums that they developed were printed in what is called the Riverbank pamphlets, but it was not printed with Elizabeth and William's names as authors. It was copywritten by Fabian and printed instead. Here on the desk we have some pictures. The large picture here is the famous Knowledge is Power picture. This is from their first graduating class of soldiers at the very beginning of World War I. Um, and this is their graduating class, really getting the Army up to speed with this whole idea of encrypted field communications. Um, the picture is a little bit um, different. Most of the time when people pose for a photo, they stand facing the camera. But some of the people in this photo are facing the camera and some of them are turned off to the side. Um, and it was a typical William and Elizabeth thing. The picture actually says knowledge is power. It's an AB code. So every four people in the picture are a letter of that phrase. Elizabeth and William really invented the science of cryptography. Um, before it had been rather hit or miss, um, but they discovered that there were certain letters used more frequently in the language. Um, there were certain phrases used more frequently in the language. Um, words like the were a common occurrence and so with this with this letter and word frequency they also developed a system where they would take um, they would take messages that were using the same code book and they would stack them on top of each other and they would literally go down through each individual message to see if there was anything the same message to message to message and what they discovered is that people tended to be lazy. Um, they tended to start their message with something innocuous to make sure that the receiver was actually receiving the complete message. And those throwaways were the keys all too often for, for William and Elizabeth to get their foot in the door and decipher the message. When William and Elizabeth relocated to DC, William stayed with Army Signals Intelligence. Elizabeth had every intention to stay at home and be a mom. She really had thought that her career in cryptography was over. Um, and to be perfectly honest, after having to, port, you know, to postpone their family during the war, they were very ready to settle down and have children. Uh, and shortly after children were born, uh, here comes a man knocking on her door, actually looking for William. Elizabeth said that she never got a job, but what they weren't looking for William first, and that, that she was their second choice. Um, but she consented to go to work 
with the caveat that she could work from home. So here she is, a woman doing something that women weren't really doing much of. And she was going to be a work from home mother, which was completely unheard of. And they brought the messages to her in the morning. The moments came where baby was asleep or baby was playing or, you know, whatever quiet minutes she had in the day, she would decode the messages. And then when William came home after they ate dinner, she would take them back into the Department of the Navy and get the next days. Her work during Prohibition entailed intercepting smugglers' communications and getting them busted. This led her to testify in many court cases against the criminals who got caught by the Coast Guard. The biggest case that she probably testified on was against Conexco, Consolidated Exporters. Um, they were a large corporation, illegal corporation, that was ex importing liquor into the United States, East Coast, West Coast, and Gulf of Mexico. They were that far spread. They were a dangerous group to go up against because they were so large and so very powerful. In fact, Conexco was owned by a man named Joseph P. Kennedy, whose son became president of the United States. When the bust was made near New Orleans, um, and and the, the arrest enabled them to arrest some of the importers, but also some that were ready to receive the liquor, um, among whom there was a gentleman named Capone, that Elizabeth was asked to come and testify in New Orleans. And she was given security, a security detail for that, because they were worried about her safety um, at this opportunity to catch such a large number of smugglers. Um, when she got to New Orleans, she found that the defense did not believe that she really had broken those codes. And so um, in a break from normal courtroom testimony, she turned to the judge and said, can you get me chalk and a chalkboard in here? And he said, well, I guess so. So in a chalkboard came and she literally taught the entire courtroom a class on the science of cryptology, cryptography in a simple format to show that it was not guesswork, it was not play acting, it was real. Um, and at that point, the defense said, we acknowledge she is an expert. And I think that that had to be one of the high points for her in her career. On one occasion, in some case, I remember I called for a blackboard <laughs> and got it and demonstrated this simple message that was going through. But I don't remember whether I did that in that particular case or not. But at any rate, I used just the one syllable words wherever I could for that poor jury. Well, then, in rebuttal, the judge said to uh, Sadie Bevilacqua, um, uh, your witness. And so I thought, here's where I have some fun. So I trotted all, out all the polysyllabic <laughs> words <laughs> in the lexicon <laughs> of codes and ciphers and um, uh, used uh, used uh, language and uh, sentences that, you know, would just kind of bowl her over, and she staggered to her feet after a few moments of red shifting and going from one side to the other. <laughs> but, Your Honor, I object. <laughs> and Judge Hutchinson leaned forward and counted his gal, and he said, You asked for this explanation. Now you listen to it. <laughs> Go on, he said to me. During the time of Prohibition, when the gangsters who were being busted by my grandmother, uh, they took out contracts on her. They took out contracts on her life. And as a result, they uh, had a couple of Secret Service officers stationed at her house to protect her. Now, they generally had guns either in the car or on themselves. Another example of my grandmother making things go the way she wanted. You guys got to come in. You have to come in and eat dinner, but you cannot bring the guns in the house. Um, and I just, you know, that, that tickles me for some reason. As to her having fear, I, I, having known my grandmother, yeah, did she have fear on occasion? Yeah, she had fear on occasion, but it was always followed with decisive action. When the United States entered World War II in 1941, Elizabeth made the switch from Coast Guard to Navy. Because of her work during Prohibition, she was coveted as a codebreaker. However, she would never receive the respect she deserved 
because she was a woman. William was a permanent employee with rank and a retirement. Elizabeth was always considered a temporary employee. She consequently, because she was considered a temporary employee, she was allowed to keep a lot of her work papers, which is the collection that we have here. The Coast Guard has nothing. They kept nothing because she was a temporary employee. They weren't bound by government policy to keep her papers. Um, William's career, of course, was more high profile than Elizabeth's. Uh, he was in charge of Arlington Hall, which was the U.S. version of Bletchley Park during World War II in Northern Virginia, and had several hundred people working for him. Uh, Elizabeth had a very tiny team at the Navy, um, and in fact, when the Coast Guard was pulled into the Navy, uh, when we entered World War II, Elizabeth was no longer allowed to be in charge of her own shop because the Navy had a policy that a woman could not be in charge of a division. And so they hired a man who didn't know as much about cryptography as she did and made him her boss, which didn't sit well with Elizabeth. One of the, the things that Elizabeth developed during Prohibition, radio uh, waves were rather new science at that time. They had learned that you could triangulate where a radio transmission was coming from from two other points. Elizabeth was probably the first one to use it in law enforcement, and they still use it in law enforcement today. Um, but she was called upon to do the same thing during World War II for the Navy, uh, not only in, the, you know, in, in, North America, in North America, but also the whole East Coast of South America. So in World War II, my grandmother uh, was breaking all the codes from all the operatives down in South America and did it virtually single-handedly with a paper and a pencil where, you know, over in Bletchley Park, they're coming up with a machine twice the size of this room to do the same thing. Without my grandmother, we're looking at a very, very different world, a very different world. We may have still won World War II, um, but perhaps not as decisively and not as quickly. Her main focus of work during World War II was catching Japanese spies and German spies. She had opportunities to do both. The vast majority of spies on the East Coast, of course, were German spies. Um, but she also had an opportunity to work directly for the FBI. She worked indirectly for the FBI. Um, we didn't have a CIA then. The FBI did work outside of the United States. So her team would locate where the spies were, and the FBI would go in and arrest the spy ring. Um, but she had an opportunity to work directly for the FBI in New York City with a case called the Doll Woman case. And the doll woman case was a woman who owned a doll shop in New York City who was a Japanese spy. She had developed a fascination for Japan in the interwar years and offered her services. And she would write letters to purported clients talking about dolls that she had purchased they might be interested in or dolls that needed repair. And the FBI was just not making headway with it. So they turned over all of the records for this case to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth was able to ascertain that when, a, when a, a letter talked about repairing a doll that was actually a ship that had been torpedoed or damaged and was not in service at the time, um, but had to go in for repairs. And she was able to, to take these letters apart and make sense of them. Um, and the woman was arrested and tried and convicted um, as a Japanese spy. The irony of this is that to this day on the FBI website where they have um, a lot of their historic cases, the doll woman case doesn't mention Elizabeth. It simply says FBI cryptographers. So, so it was really um, an effort on the part of J. Edgar Hoover to make sure that the general public did not become aware that their code breaker really was a middle-aged woman from the Midwestern United States. He did not want anyone to know that. So he deliberately removed her name from any document or any communications that were kept by the FBI. One of her biggest accomplishments in World War II was keeping the supply line in the Atlantic open for the Allies. Without this supply line, the English would have been in far greater danger, which would have thrown the whole Allied cause into jeopardy. She used code breaking and the triangulation techniques she developed during Prohibition to keep ships out of danger and able to travel with essential goods and troops. One of the ships that she saved more than a few times was the Queen Mary. The Queen Mary was a troop ship that carried soldiers first over to North Africa 
and to Italy and then over to England um, getting ready for the invasion across the channel. Um, one of those trips was for the 29th Infantry Division, a federalized National Guard unit that was slated to be a part of the D-Day invasion. Um, and we don't know if she saved that journey or not specifically, but my dad was on that ship. And so knowing that Elizabeth had made so much headway in protecting the shipping of material, but also people, is powerful to me because how would D-Day have been different if they'd had to substitute a less well-trained unit because the ship had gone down? Certainly, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. The problem with genius is it can drive you a little crazy because you see connections that most people do not see. William's code-breaking work caused him to have a breakdown in 1941. Both the strain of working as hard as he was and the horrifying content of the messages he was decrypting contributed to this. He was hospitalized at this time and throughout his breakdown and hospitalization, Elizabeth stayed by his side and encouraged him, all while doing her own code-breaking work and taking care of the family. So my grandfather had been working tirelessly on breaking uh, purple and had done so. Uh, the official story is that drove him a little nutty. And of course, my grandmother, being the person that she was, took care of my grandfather, absolutely. I don't think that my grandfather would have done half of what he had done with, I don't think he would have done any of the things that he accomplished without her, I really don't. I think that she was, in any relationship throughout history, there is generally a woman behind the man who is given all of the uh, accolades of the accomplishments. There is generally a good woman behind him. But my, grandf my grandmother absolutely took great care of my grandmother throughout their entire lives. My grandfather called my grandmother his divine fire. And she was really the reason that he did most of, if not everything, that he did. He was devoted to her, she was an inspiration to him, and she took care of him. It was a 50-year love story. Through the ups and downs of illness and children and family and wars and employment and unemployment, um, it was just a consistent love story the whole time. They never fell out of love with each other. My grandmother and grandfather always worked um, psychically together. There's a section in The Man Who Broke Purple where my grandfather, they were given a task to break a code of a new cipher machine that had been developed and supposedly it was unbreakable. My grandfather talked to my grandmother. He goes, clear your mind of everything and I'm gonna say a word and you say the first thing that comes to your mind. And he says, I think he said cipher and she said machine. And they had the unbreakable cipher machine broken in about two hours. William knew that Elizabeth loved roses and her favorite rose was called a talisman rose. It was yellow with a little bit of pink on it. And so when they built their home in Military Road in Washington, D.C., he planted several bushes of talisman roses. And they're a constant bloomer, so they would bloom over the course of the summer and she would always have roses. Later in their married lives where their children were grown and they downsized to a townhouse in Capitol Hill, their little guard out back didn't have room for rose bushes, so he found a climbing version of the bush and planted it. And we have a picture of him standing in front of this, this wall with the roses just running over the side out almost onto the sidewalk, right there on Capitol Hill. Friedman occasionally worked with the FBI, led by J. Edgar Hoover, during World War II, especially in her work on the South American front. The Bureau took credit for a lot of what Friedman did. To be perfectly candid, Hoover was a misogynist. Women were not given a lot of credit for what they did in their um, work was stolen. J. Edgar Hoover was very proud of his G-men and he wanted his G-men to be looked at as heroic and strong and very masculine and he felt that having a middle-aged woman be their primary code breaker uh, was not in keeping with the image he wished to portray for the FBI so he literally deliberately removed her from history um, so that that would never get out to the American public. When J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI tried to take credit for the code-breaking work that my grandmother had done in South America. 
she she thought a that J or Edgar Hoover was an idiot um, because the last thing you do when you've broken someone's codes is tell them that you've broken their codes. Hello. Now she never voiced that opinion outside of, of, of the family. She never wrote a letter to J. Edgar Hoover saying you're an idiot because she knew that wouldn't get anywhere. She kept it to herself and kept doing her work and, and doubled down because they changed all the, after that, they changed the machines, right? They went to, I think a six rotor, uh, Enigma machine and she still broke it. But she didn't go and attack the FBI or J. Edgar Hoover. She just kept doing what she knew she had to do because that was the honorable thing to do. It was more important to her that the war was won from her doing diligent work than getting credit for it. Even if the FBI and Hoover hadn't taken the credit for her work, the Navy made Elizabeth swear an oath of secrecy until death. No one, not even William, knew how much of a hero she was. She told her friends that she was carrying on with a, quote, routine Navy job. William died in 1969, leaving Elizabeth on her own until her death in 1980. At the age of 88, she died alone in a nursing home. Her savings had dwindled, so she died a poor woman. In 2008, parts of her work were finally declassified and revealed to the public. There have been several books written about Elizabeth, as well as a documentary made by PBS in 2021. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives dedicated an auditorium in honor of Prohibition investigator and crypt analyst Elizabeth Friedman at their national headquarters. Elizabeth's alma mater is honoring her by adding a statue of her at the Alan P. Kirby Jr. Center, Hillsdale's satellite campus in Washington, D.C. So Dr. Iron um, reached out to me and asked me to create this sculpture of Elizabeth Smith Friedman. Um, I think once he kind of learned about her um, and the knowledge that he gained, um, just kind of found her to be an inspiring person. Um, and obviously a connection to the college. Um, so I reached out and had the idea of doing a relief um, portrait of her. And um, I think there's um, plans to do two copies. Um, so one will be on Hillsdale's campus and then one will be in DC. I like to say my life is overwhelmed with blessings and they compete with each other for time. Everybody's life is like that, right? And hers was like that. And one of the great things about her is the way she navigated that so well. A great takeaway for all the, the women of Hillsdale College to, to keep in mind is that's a lot easier today because of the work that she did. She was a pioneer and she may not have single-handedly paved the way, but she certainly helped. And to develop that type of intestinal fortitude and determination and courage and will is an essential part of being successful. People around the nation are finally starting to realize that we have forgotten a true American hero. A woman who saved lives, broke codes, and got her start at Hillsdale College. <laughs>